Hello, everyone. Welcome to the lecture today. Um, this is the machine learning for visual understanding course. And today is the second lecture, uh, which is the first approach for image classification. So before we start, uh, okay. So this is a uh, repeat of um, our announcements from the last, uh, last lecture. So please turn on your video. Uh, this is the policy for this course. So everyone is expected to turn on your turn on your video during the lecture so that I can see your face. And uh, that makes it easier for me to interact with uh, students. So please turn on your uh, video and um, please turn off your audio by default. But when I have any question, uh, I will ask you. And you may also ask questions. Um, so please be ready to talk any anytime. And um, I last time I um, uh, mentioned that if you are, uh, if your camera is turned off and uh, when I ask you a question, but you don't answer, then uh, maybe some degrade, uh, I, I will degrade your um, final grade. So that's a new policy for this semester. Please uh, turn on your camera by default, okay? Okay, so thanks for your um, cooperation. So today we are going to start, learn about our uh, visual understanding using machine learning. And uh, the first um, few weeks we'll be uh, using the lectures from uh, Professor Fei Fei Li in Stanford, which is uh, one of the most popular computer vision course. So I'm going to uh, use her material to uh, initiate our um, discussions in this class. And later, uh, probably from the October, uh, I, will, um, uh, I will teach the, the new materials, which is not covered in the lecture mostly. So uh, this is the disclaimer for that. So let me start with uh, what is the image classification task? So we are going to start with the, this particular task for the few weeks uh, at the beginning. And we are going to um, build some models on top of that, which is the deep learning models. And um, yeah, so that is the beginning of our course. So let's first define what is the image classification task. This is a core task in computer vision. So the input is an image, a uh, digitized image. And given this image, the task is, um, assuming that we have some uh, predefined set of labels, we would like to uh, figure out what is this image about. So in this case, we would like to output cat because the cat is in uh, our uh, labor set, predefined labor set. If we don't have it, a cat in this labor set, maybe we should say uh, this is nothing because uh, we don't have the cat. But Or we may say that this is a dog uh, instead of plane or truck. But um, usually we deal with uh, some predefined labor set with, uh, with at least one ground truth uh, in the image. So uh, it sounds very intuitive given a uh, photo of cat, and we would like to say that that's a cat. And uh, this task may be uh, more further classified into single versus multi-class classification. So if uh, we deal with some cases that uh, there are multiple objects in the image, when, and we'd like to classify that where this photo is about cat and dog, or uh, this is a building and a plane or something like that, uh, that is the multi-labor or multi-class classification task. But for more simplicity, we are going to start with the single class uh, classification at the beginning. As we discussed in the last lecture, what a machine sees is not a cat like this actually. For machines, this is just a um, sequence of or matrix of um, numbers, right? Do you remember that? So. Uh, we usually represent an image with uh, RGB code. So each pixel is represented with three numbers, uh, which is integers from 0 to two, uh, 255. And uh, th this image is just a three, uh, two dimensional uh, matrix of those uh, pixel values, uh, which cont uh, contains the RGB code. So as you, as you remember, uh, this is just an image, it's just a sequence of a bunch of numbers. For example, in this image, uh, if, if we assume that this, the scale, the size of this image is 600 by 800, then 
The input matrix or input tensor is of the shape of 600 times 800 times 3 because we have RGB codes. Uh, we have three numbers in each pixel. So the input shape of the tensor is uh, the 600 times 800 times 3. Please remember that. Uh, why image classification is challenging or why, why is it hard? So uh, I'm, I'm going to show some examples why uh, image classification is a challenging task. The first one is the, the scale variation. So we'd like to recognize some object in the image, but we don't know uh, what scale it, uh, that object is in, in the image. So for example, we see this uh, sculpture of the uh, Isun Shin in, this in both of these images. But one of them, uh, he is really huge, and uh, his uh, his scale is like the entire uh, screen. But in in the in the left one, you see that uh, his sculpture. We still recognize that this is the sculpture of Isun Shin, but that's just a small object, and we see a lot of other objects like buildings or um, some persons and the, some vehicles and mountains here. So. We, we know that uh, in both images, we, we see this sculpture, but that's, uh, uh, the scale is very different. So we, we don't have that information in advance. We need to recognize this uh, without prior information that uh, what scale uh, of that sculpture is. And also another challenge is the viewpoint variation. We, know, we all know that this is a cat, but um, when we take uh, its picture from the right, or from the left, or from the top, or from the bottom, or from the uh, any any directions. Actually, uh, depending on the direction of this uh, picture, even if uh, this cat doesn't move, still uh, what we see will be completely different. Especially if we um, see we, if we consider the its actual um, pixel-wise uh, distribution, the pixels will be completely different if we just move the uh, video or the camera. Uh, just slightly to the, its next position. So all pixels basically change when, when the camera slightly moves. So that's a challenge, right? If uh, our, our basic assumption is that if the object is this, uh, um, just static and if we slightly move the camera, then we expect that the, the pixels should uh, also uh, just slightly change. But that's not true, actually. Um, when we uh, move the camera, uh, all the pixels will change. So how can we um, robustly figure out this is a cat? That's another challenge. And um, this is background clutter. So uh, as, as you see in these pictures, um, we can recognize that these are cats. But uh, we know that um, well, this is a white cat, but uh, the background is also white colored. and same texture, actually similar texture, and the same thing on the right. So it's something like uh, some hidden figure uh, recognition, but um, this is um, so something more challenging, it makes the uh, image classification more challenging. Um, and also, illumination is another important factor. We know that um, these two pictures were taken at the, exactly the same place, but uh, its RGB pixel can be very different depending on what time of uh, the day is. So in the in the daytime, we see that this uh, wheel uh, is colored with white, as I see, and it may look black, but uh, at night, they are um, actually looking like a pink or a red. So it will have the higher values in the red, uh, red components and smaller values in other components, but it's completely different in day and night. So, uh, when we teach that this is a wheel or this is some uh, this is some buildings or anything, then what should we teach to the machine? Is this red or this is white? Or this is black, we, or we just need to teach the shape. So it's it makes things uh, more complicated uh, when you consider these changes in illumination. And even if it's not uh, extreme like this, even if uh, in in the uh, daytime in the same daytime. Still, it can change, uh, and especially you know, we, when you take the camera, uh, when the, uh, what the camera actually sees is very different from what human sees. From our understanding that um, these colors doesn't change at all, but actually uh, what, uh, when we take the camera, actually that the pixels uh, 
colors are uh, changing in real time. So uh, it, it is another challenge that uh, the illumination actually changes uh, over time. And uh, occlusion is another challenge uh, that actually we encounter very frequently. We know that where this is a face of cat, but uh, it, does, it doesn't show the entire shape of the cat. So if a baby uh, doesn't uh, actually have, hasn't seen the cat very much and only ha has seen the uh, shape of the cat just a few times, then it might be challenging for even for the uh, human baby to recognize that this is a cat because uh, this, the, the face shape of the cat maybe uh, looks similar to other animals. Uh, especially uh, in the last one, it's even more uh, challenging because we, we just see the tail of the uh, target object and we are really not sure whether this is the uh, tail of the cat or dog or any other, other, um, uh, other animals. So occlusion is a long standing challenge of computer vision and image recognition. Uh, and it's still uh, under active research. So this is actually an interesting topic to uh, conduct further research uh, because it's, this is indeed challenging. And another challenge is deformation. Deformation means uh, shape of uh, the target object may not be rigid and it can be changing uh, like this, uh, basically, the human uh, pose can take, um, for example, uh, we, we know that um, the hands are below the face, right? But we can change that, just deform it like this. And then the hands is over my face. So we, human, can uh, change our position, pose or form, formation uh, in very various ways, right? Some other objects like um, football or computers, they are more rigid. So they, they don't change their uh, formation that much. We just change its location or the direction uh, of the viewpoints. But uh, some uh, objects like humans or animals, they can uh, change their formation. So what should we uh, recognize? We, we sh should be able to still recognize that that's a human or that's a cat from various of um, changes uh, of the pose. So that's another challenges. What else? Uh, probably this is the last one. Um, inter intra-class variation. We call uh, all of these objects we see here, uh, they are vehicles or cars or um, sedans or whatever. We, we call them uh, with the same uh, class. Uh, they are cars. But are they look same? No, right? All the uh, brands and the um, size of the cars are different. And um, we see that uh, the color of those vehicles are also different. Some of them are white, some of them are red, some of them are uh, yellows. So if we um, teach the machine, um, we should not uh, use the color as uh, its indicator. If we show the, only the black cars to the machine, then uh, the machine will learn that, wow, car is uh, something black. But that's not true, right? So when we define the class, we should uh, consider what is the intra-class variation which is allowed and which is not allowed in, in that class. If we have uh, just car labor in the, in the data set, then the intra-class variation should include not just the uh, color, color or um, the shape of the uh, cars, but also maybe that needs to include the trucks or the uh, vans or some, some other types of uh, vehicles. But if we have uh, those labors in a separate labors like trucks, then trucks should, be, should not be uh, part of these regular sedans or cars. So intra-class variation is another difficulty that we need to uh, consider when we, when we conduct the uh, image classification. So, how should we build an image classifier? So uh, I assume that all of you are now familiar with uh, Python programming. So we'd like to uh, build some function called classify image, which is basically taking an image as an input. Uh, okay, this is a um, three dimensional tensor of size uh, with, time, with times the height times the number of channels, which is three RGB. 
And we do some coding here, and then we'd like to output the class label. So if we have the input of the, the cat, what we'd like to output is cat. But what should we do uh, here? So probably you have learned uh, a lot of uh, algorithms or in the previous data structures or algorithm classes, like sorting a list of numbers. So we, we know that how to do that. And once we learn the algorithm, then we can code it, right? What should we do? What is the high level idea? What uh, we can classify an image if that's a cat or a car or something else? Any idea? It's really challenging, right? So paper has tried something like this. Given this image, uh, how can we code uh, to classify if this is a cat or not? So uh, paper has tried, OK, so this is too complex because in pixel levels, the color changes too much and too frequently, and it's too complicated. So OK, let's try to make it simpler. So let's try to find some edges. Uh, so that can be done uh, by using some rules, like uh, when we compare the, the pixels, nearby pixels, and if that changes very sharply, OK, then that is defined as an edge. And otherwise, it's not. Or they may use some signal processing techniques that was developed a uh, long time ago. So anyway, I don't go to the details, but suppose we have these edges found from this figure. And now this is just black and white. So it's much simpler. Now it may be uh, possible that we can use some uh, handcrafted rules to find the corners, like uh, the the uh, ears or the nose or the eyes, maybe we, it seems like we may be able to find some rules here. And then what? It's still not sure, right? Uh, how should we define what is a cat and how can you rec recognize a cat from these uh, edges? So people has tried this kind of attempts, but it's not still trivial to code what, uh, what is a cat and how can we recognize that from a picture? So uh, in this class, we are going to use machine learning for the entire semester. So we are not going to define some handcrafted rules like that. Um, here, we are going to use data-driven approach. So this is the just rough three steps of machine learning. We collect a data set of the images and labels. Here, the labels means that uh, the, the ground truth of what is the main topic of that image. So given a uh, photo of cat, the label is cat. And we use some machine learning algorithm, which we are going to learn during the semester, to train a classifier, and then use the trained classifier to predict unseen images. These are the basic steps of machine learning. So what we need to build are the two things, two functions. The train, in at the train step, we are given a set of images with its labels. And we do some machine learning to output some model uh, in the training step. And use that model in, in the test step. We are going to use that model and a new image, which is we have not seen in the train step. We use that model to output the predicted labor of that image. So these are the, uh, the basic uh, step of machine learning, uh, which we are going to use in, uh, through this class. And as you know, uh, machine learning is just a uh, data-driven approach. We are going to, we are not define uh, what are each classes in, in a, a handcrafted manner. Instead, we just give a, a bunch of examples. This is an airplane, this is an airplane, this is an airplane, this is automobile, this is bird. We just repeat this with different examples uh, until the machine can recognize, OK, uh, I learned, OK, this is airplane, this is airplane, this is airplane, uh, again and again. Then, oh, OK, airplane looks like this. It, uh, it will figure out um, the basic um, common uh, reason reasoning about what is an airplane, uh, and then it will um, be able to classify an unseen image of airplanes as airplane. So that is our expectation. So how should we do that? 
So today, we are going to learn two types of uh, basic classifiers, which we can apply for image classification tasks. And probably if you have taken um, the prerequisite machine learning courses for this, uh, probably you have heard of this. So that will be a review session for those students. If you are new to this, uh, this might be a little bit fast paced. So please um, review the materials that I provide on the website. Um, and uh, if, if you're not able to follow this, uh, please let me know. Then uh, I, I will um, give you the guidance that if this course is uh, right for you or not. Um, so let's start with the first classifier, which is called uh, nearest neighbor classifier. Nearest neighbor is really simple idea that um, we just take the uh, training set, which are labeled, and use the closest few examples for each unseen images to classify what it is. So suppose each image is embedded into this two-dimensional space for simplicity. And this uh, color and the shape represents its class. So these are blue classes, so these are red classes, and these are green classes. And suppose we have uh, three unseen images, then which class we would like to classify it? Uh, let's call this to um, um, Park so -yeon. Yes. Yeah, which class do you expect that this uh, unseen image belongs to? The red one, red circle. Sorry? The red circle one. Yeah, the circle one. And what about this? The blue square. Blue one. And what about this? The green. Yes. Good job. Thanks. Uh, let's do another exercise. Uh, Im Junsu. Yes, Professor. Yes. Uh, what do you think this would be? Uh, which class do you think this one is, uh, belongs to? I think it it would belong to the red red class. And what about this? Um, it's not uh, obvious because it belongs to the boundary of each classes. And what about this? Uh, it also, it is also not obvious, uh, but I think it belongs to Rion. Okay, so uh, as, as all of you has recognized, I asked the easier questions to the first students and the harder questions to the second student, and probably uh, you know that why. Oh, why is it harder? As the second student, uh, Junsu said, um, these example, uh, these unseen examples are uh, at the boundary of each class. So when we use the nearest neighbor classifier, it is not obvious that which one is the nearest neighbor, right? And for the last one, uh, we may not say that this is red for sure, but it's unclear. It's either green or blue. So uh, yeah, that's true. It's it's not. Uh, obvious to classify these, uh, especially the unseen examples at the boundary. What about this? Eugene, Kim Eugene? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you think this unseen example belongs to? Uh, square run. Mm -hmm. Square run. Blue square. Okay. Square, blue square, yes. And what about this? Uh, green triangle. Why? Uh, uh, it is near uh, with green triangle, so. Yeah, it's slightly closer to the green uh, training example than the blue one or the red one. So yeah, that's, that's a good answer. So we, uh, that's a good exercise that we just uh, showed um, just a few training examples and I, told you that this is the nearest neighbor. So you're trying to find the, what is the nearest neighbor and just trying to get the color of that. So that is exactly what we are doing in this class. So, okay, oh, good job, Eugene. So 
for the query, uh, we call that uh, these uh, question marks as query or test data points. We find the K or one closest training data points in uh, those are the colored, um, the labeled uh, training points, data points, and we predict using its labels. So as the uh, as uh, student Eugene said, the um, this one is closest to this green data points. So we uh, classify it as green. It may be correct or it may be incorrect. So uh, let's see. So this this is the essence of the nearest neighbors. But uh, let's see more details about that. So as I told you, in machine learning, what we need to do is building these two classes, the train and predict. And uh, sorry, not class, the functions. and in the nearest neighbor classifiers, what we do in the training step is just memorizing all the data and the labels. Because uh, we, need, we will need all of these training points uh, at the test or prediction step, right? So we just memorize all of these images and labels. That's it. We don't do anything. At the prediction step, actually, we need to uh, find what is the closest training data points for the uh, query image, uh, the test image here. So we output the label of the most similar or closest training example. So that is just a predict step, which is intuitively very simple. So let's do this. Um, this is the query image. And uh, suppose these are um, the 100 training uh, examples. And what should be the output of this? Noisy, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, let me ask to Songyan, Park Songyan. Yes. Yes. Uh, what, uh, which one is the actually? What, what is the uh, expected output pass for this image? Oh, cat. Oh, cat. Oh, uh, how did you know that? Oh. Because the labor training data says it is cat. Sorry, can you say that again? The labor training data of cat is similar to this query image. So how did you know that? Uh, so we have these 100 images in the training data set. And our task is finding the closest image to this query image. And which one is the closest image in this uh, among these 100? Oh, the figure? Yeah. It's similar to the cat. OK, so you're still using your human knowledge, not uh, machines pixel-wise comparison. So uh, OK, it's, it's OK. So you're, what you're doing is, um, sorry, Songyan, um, please turn it off. The audio, yeah. So I asked one student, which is impossible. Uh, so actually, she used her um, prior knowledge or a human intuition to figure out that's a cat. But actually, for machines, what we need is comparing all the images. Uh, so given these query images, we need to compute the similarity or distance between uh, the query image and all the training. Uh, all the images in the training data. So suppose we have some similarity functions like this, it may output uh, some similarity scores like this. And we have the highest similarity score for this particular image. And we know that this is labeled as a cat. We output the cat. But how? What should be the similarity function? We, we don't have that yet. So it, it's not trivial to compute the similarity between two images, right? So one idea is um, we know that uh, an image is two-dimensional matrix of integers. So we may use some distance metric between the two matrices. 
And suppose these are in the same size, or we can resize the target image to uh, the same size of the training images. So suppose that this uh, cat image is uh, represented as this matrix, and the second one is defined as this, then it's more uh, trivial to compute the distance between these two. We still have multiple options, but one option may be the L1 distance or absolute distance. So given two matrices, we take its uh, subtraction and take the absolute values because uh, one can be larger than the other or vice versa. So we compute the distance between these two matrices like that and uh, the result is given like this. And because we have too many values in this matrix, we just take the summation of that. So this 1,168 is the uh, distance between these two matrices or two images. So if, what if uh, we give the exactly the same two images as input a, as A and B, then it will be exactly the same. So when we take the difference, then it will be zero, right? So that is the smallest distance when A and B are exactly the same. Suppose we have changed the, the pixel values of one image just a little bit, then for human, uh, that will look very similar to each other. So in that case, uh, most of these values will be still zero and only one pixel was changed. So that difference will be reflected in, in the subtraction and the summation will be like, uh, like five or 10, just a small change in the one pixel. So it looks intuitive, right? If two images are exactly the same, then the distance will be zero. And if the images are almost the same, but just a few pixels are uh, modified, then the sum, sum will be slightly larger than zero, but still small. And if two images are completely different like this time, one is the cat and the other is the airplane, then the uh, difference will be large like this, so which makes sense a little bit. Or we can do the same thing with L2 distance, which is the square dif difference. Instead of using the absolute values, we take the uh, element wise um, square uh, in each values, and then we take the average. Just philosophically, they are the same thing. So here's the implementation of the nearest neighbor classifier using that idea. As I told you, in the training step, we don't do anything. We just store or memorize the, all the training data in the memory. So given the images and the labels, we would like to just store that in, uh, as a uh, class variables. So we define the self.images and we just store it and self.labels and we just store it. So that's it. And in the predictions, we are given a new test image, which is not part of these training images. And what we need to do is uh, in high level, for this test image, we need to find the closest train image and predict with its labor. That's high level idea of these prediction steps. But let's see the code to how, how should we do that. Uh, by the way, this is not the most efficient way of implementation, but just for a high level uh, idea, I, uh, I implemented using uh, this loop. In reality, we actually need to vectorize to make this faster. So uh, you are going to do that in your homework, but uh, here I'm using inefficient code to explain what it is. So we start with the minimum distance variable with uh, largest possible uh, integer values um, here. And we go over all the training examples. So self.images is uh, the, the training images and its shape is the number of images times the number of dimensionalities. So uh, shape zero means the number of images. And we this i is the index of the training image we are currently comparing against. So go over this uh, all the images in the training data set and we compute the distance between this um, training image and the test image. Assume that they are in the same shape or same size. So we can just simply take the subtraction between those two matrices and we take the absolute values. So we are, uh, again, we are using this distance. So when you comp comp uh, compute the the, uh, the absolute, absolute difference between A and B, we take the subtraction and take the NumPy absolute function 
to compute the absolute values. And then we sum over all the, the output scores. So now that is the distance. So this line computes, basically computes the L1 distance we just showed in, in the previous slides, right? And if this distance is smaller than the minimum distance we have so far, then this current image, the current training image is the uh, closest uh, or most similar image to the test image. So we keep that. So we need to keep two things. One is the index of that training image and also the, the current minimum distance is updated here. And in the next image, we will compare again. And if that's smaller, then it will be also updated. And we just repeat this until the end of the training set here. Then by this point, we have computed the distance between the test image and all the training images. And now we have uh, the minimum distance, which is the most similar images distance uh, to the test image. And we also know what is that image by this storing this index. And what we output is the label of that uh, closest image or most similar image, which is uh, self.labors and the index is minimum index. So this is very simple code. We just go over the training examples and compute the distance between the test image and all the training images. And we remember uh, what is the most uh, closest Im image and what is the label of that. And we just output it. So this is the simplement, simplest implementation of the uh, nearest neighbor classifier. Okay, let's talk about its uh, time complexity. Suppose we have N training examples. What is the time complexity of this code for training and for prediction? Let me ask this to uh, Jiho, Kim Jiho. Yes, Professor. Yes, what is the uh, time complexity for the training? N. Uh, Order of N, why? Yes. Because it's go over for the whole images with the four, uh, four loop. Uh, I'm asking the train, not the predict. Uh, oh, train. Just uh, it's it. Uh, just put input inside, mm -hmm. and it, it's me memorizing all images. So, or yeah. So, what is the time complexity? C zero. Just one, four. zero. Yeah, we say it's one. Oh, one. I think it's zero because we <laughs> do something. So yeah, yeah, that's a good job. So we are given just a pointer of the images and labels, and we just store that in some variables. So it's regardless of the size of the images and labels, the time complexity is just order of one because these are already loaded and it's stored in these variables. So we don't have to go over the, the images or labels. And we just store its pointers. So it's just order of one, right? And let me ask the next one to um, Yerim, Kim Yerim. Yes. Yeah, what is the time complexity for the predict? Uh, order of N. Why? Because for the, for the each images, we should compare the n examples. Mm -hmm. So order of n. Yeah, that's correct, right? We we need to go over the, all the training examples. So, so the time complexity of this function is order of n. Now, is this good or bad? So to summarize, when we train, the training complexity is not uh, dependent on the size of the training set. So if we have billions of images, the training is done immediately. But when we predict, we need to go over the, that large training sets. So it's, it's a good trade off. It's a trade off between the training and prediction. So training is fast, prediction is slow, right? Is it good or bad? 
어, 지섭, 윤지섭. 오케이. 어, yes, professor, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Uh, Do you think it's good or bad? Uh, I think it is. It is for. Uh, I think it is worse than uh, hard training and uh, hard training and easy prediction because uh, training can be done in advance. Uh, however, the prediction uh, uh, should be uh, on on demand. So uh, I think it is worse than uh, mm -hmm. the the, uh, the counterpart. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, uh, that's a good answer. So uh, as Jisok said, when we do the training, training is usually just, just done, done once. We have the model and then we launch the model in production and the prediction needs to be done all the time. Suppose you are launching this uh, for the YouTube. So the training can be done just once. And when the YouTube is uh, providing the service and you are just connected to the, uh, the system as a user, then YouTube needs to uh, compute its uh, recommendation list or the, your search result whenever it has the request, right? So prediction is done for all the users, for all the sessions, all the time. So if this pr prediction is slow, that is horrible. We need to compute and output uh, these nearest neighbors or whatever in real time in, in most actual services. So usually it is acceptable to have some more complex and slow training, but the prediction needs to be fast. So nearest neighbor is not a good classifier actually in real production. Anyway, this works, especially in the small data sets, it's okay. So let's see the decision boundary. Suppose we have these five classes in, uh, in this data set and these dots are the training points and this image shows the decision boundary between the classes so suppose we have some example here that means this will be classified as the purple class and if the point is located here uh, that is uh, classified as the red so if you see that um, these bond, uh, decision boundaries, uh, you see that these are not as smooth as we expect because we have the red dots here and blue dots here and red dots here. Uh, it shape just follow its decision boundary like that. And we, we recognize some uh, yellow island here. So this, this is a little bit weird, right? Because this, this is the territory of the green the country of green, but uh, this has some uh, yellow territory of the uh, inside that uh, land, which is not natural. So usually when we have an example here, we may expect that this is green if we don't have this yellow uh, island here. So in often cases, actually, this is the output, uh, this is the result of um, noisy labors or uh, misleading data collection. So there are usually some noises in the in the data collection steps, and if this is an error of uh, this is if this is an outcome of such an error, then because of this one example, we are actually uh, incorrectly classifying these uh, areas. So uh, one way to overcome this um, kind of error is using multiple neighbors instead of just single one. So if we use uh, k nearest neighbors instead of just one, we actually do the majority vote among uh, three or five or k nearest neighbors for the query points. So suppose uh, we have a point here, right here. Do you see the points? Uh, what are the closest data points to this one? Probably this yellow one and this green one and this green one. So these three points were majority vote uh, what color this should be and uh, we have two greens and one yellow so we will say that okay we if, even though it's just two to one not three to zero still green is majority vote so we are going to classify this point as green and now this yellow points does not uh, affect the uh, predicted labors of these nearby uh, regions because it's surrounded by all greens 
But now uh, we see some white areas, which is undecidable. So uh, for example, this white island is um, the near, three nearest points are blue, purple, and green. So all of them are tied. So it's undecidable, this, this area. For example, this area is the tied area between the blue, uh, red, and green. So because it's one to one to one, we cannot decide whether this is uh, one of the, those classes. When you use k uh, equals to five, uh, those white areas gets larger, but it's more robust when we have more data points like this. So using more uh, like a larger k uh, value of k is um, making the classifier more robust, but it increases the chance that we cannot decide because there are, uh, are bigger chances of the tied results. And this showed the, uh, the effect of using different distance functions. So we have introduced the L1 distance function and the L2 distance functions. And you see that these are similar basically, but uh, the actual shape of the, the decision boundary are slightly different. So think about why they are different, uh, especially in the extreme cases, but uh, basically they look just similar to each other. And another question will be, how should we decide what is the best value of K or what is the best uh, distance metric for my own data set? So these are called hyperparameters and uh, which is that not, when, when you call the parameters, that is, uh, they are learned during the, uh, the machine learning or training steps. Hyperparameters are not learned from the data. It's decided by the human just you. So we need to choose what uh, hyperparameters for your particular data set and your particular instance of uh, machine learning. So uh, these need to be done by you, but we, uh, it's not learned from the data. So uh, how should we decide these values? We usually decide these empirically. So uh, we usually try, uh, try many different choices and choose what works actually the best. So we are going to um, discuss more about this uh, hyperparameter selection in the next lecture. But here we just, uh, just intuitively say that we try multiple times and choose the best one. So, uh, so far we have tried the nearest neighbors classifier on the image classification, but uh, does it work where or not? We don't know yet, right? Uh, it's usually horrible. Unfortunately, uh, nearest neighbor classifier is never used actually uh, for the pixel distance uh, uh, image classification. So here's an example. Suppose we have this original image in, in the middle and we slightly change this image in three different ways. One is uh, changing the color tint slightly. And one is uh, the right one is shifting the entire image to, uh, by one pixel to the right. And the left one is uh, just blacking out the eyes and uh, mouth of this person. All of these three are in the same L2 distance from the original, surprisingly. But intuitively speaking, as, hum as human sees, these three images are completely different. So using the uh, pixel distance as the distance metric is actually a horrible idea for most uh, image classification tasks. These are just an example of that. And another uh, disadvantage of this approach is uh, cost of dimensionalities. So uh, it says that um, depending on the, the uh, dimensionality of the input, uh, input vector or input um, data, we need exponentially increasing number of examples for uh, higher dimensional data, which means uh, suppose we have one, just one dimensional data points and with four data points, we can uh, have the density of uh, data points like this. So average distance between each examples uh, is like that, this distance. To keep this average distance in two dimensional space, how many examples do we need? we need 16 because we have uh, two dimensionalities now and 
we can fit uh, 16 data points to keep the same distance between the nearest neighbors. If we have three dimensional input vectors, then it's 64 points are fitted into that uh, same size of cube. And each example, uh, each nearest neighbors are now in the same distance, within the same distance. At least we need 64 data points here, which means we, if we have the d-dimensional data points, uh, d-dimensional input uh, vectors in, in our uh, image, then we need uh, exponentially increasing uh, four to the d data, uh, data points to keep the near uh, the average or the uh, the uh, closest di distance between the two data points. So this is the cost of dimensionality. When we have a uh, high dimensional input vector, we need exponentially increasing number of data examples. But what is the input dimensionality of the images? As you remember, it was, for example, 600 times 800 times three, which is a lot larger than these one to three, right? So that is that means uh, to represent the the ca uh, capacity of the uh, data set, the nearest neighbor is actually a horrible choice. Uh, given on points, the nearest neighbor to that uh, query points will be actually very very far from it, uh, with high probability if we don't have that large scale data sets. And collecting large scale data set is really challenging in image classification because. First of all, images are multimedia data, which is not small. And also we need to label them, right? Labeling an image is a time consuming task. So uh, because of this cost of dimensionality, the nearest neighbor classifier is actually never used for uh, commercial uh, image, image classifiers. So uh, in nearest neighbors, uh, in practice, um, you may keep this in mind. Uh, so Considering a normalization, uh, so the, as, as I told you, the RGB pixels are ranging from 0 to 255, but uh, dealing with all the positive numbers is problematic in reality. I, I don't go to the uh, deep discussion over that, but um, actually normalizing that to uh, some minus 1 to 1 or 0 to 1 is, uh, makes more sense, uh, and it makes it easier to model them. And um, instead of dealing with the entire uh, dimensionality, like 600 times 800 times three, uh, some dimension reduction techniques are useful. Uh, we are going to deal with some dimension reduction techniques in lecture six and seven, uh, but um, that's sometimes helpful. And uh, split the data set into train and validation sets to uh, choose the hyperparameters, where we are going to discuss about this in the next lecture. So let me just skip that for now. And for faster computation, there are approximate uh, nearest neighbors library available. So instead of computing the rear, the best, most closest example, we may use some approximately nearest neighbors. Uh, it's still acceptable in, in most cases, so, but it's much faster. So you may uh, also consider this using some approximated algorithm for the nearest, nearest neighbor computation. So these are just advices for the practical uh, application of the nearest neighbors. So, so far uh, we have learned the first classifier, which is, which is the nearest neighbor classifier. Uh, and we have seen its limitations. So let's move on to the next classifier, which is the linear classifier. Do you have any question for now? Okay, I guess no. So let's move on to the linear classifier. So now we are going to do some parametric approach. Uh, so instead of, instead of memorizing all the training examples, we would like to learn some function called f, which maps the input image x to the label scores called y. So I'm going to use the same color here. The images are always blue and classes are always green. So given an image, we would like to learn some function of x. We would like to output the scores for each label. 
And we, ex we would like to make this function to output the highest score for the cat label here. So what should be the form of the function? So as I told the title of this lecture is linear classifier. We may use the linear function, but that's not necessarily. We, we can do actually any kind of functions here, but let's start with the simplest one, the linear function, which is the function output uh, the weighted sum of input pixels. So given an image, which is uh, the two-dimensional matrix of the uh, integer values, we would like to have some weights or parameters. So here we call it parameters. It's different from hyperparameters, which is decided by the human. Here the parameters are decided by the data. So weights called W, I, I'm going to use the red color for all, all the weights. Um, Weights are the same uh, size matrix uh, with the in input image. And each of those are multiplied to the pixel values. And they are summed uh, to have the final score. Again, okay. linear classifier outputs weighted sum of input pixels. So we need uh, the same size vector or matrix of weights to the input image. OK, so uh, if this is 600 by 800 by 3, the weights are also in the same shape, 600 by 800 by 3. And each of those corresponding uh, weights are multiplied to uh, pixel values in the input. And we sum over all of those like that to have the final score. And this score is corresponding to the first class, which is airplane. And we actually do repeat this 10 times or uh, the number of class times um, to have the different weights for each class uh, in a similar way. And then we will have 10 different scores. Then we will take the max one to classify the image. Okay. So uh, we need to determine the values of W from the data so that we can uh, output the highest score for each image uh, for the correct labels. So for this example, we have the image of cat and we compute uh, the, the, the score of this image for each class using the corresponding weights for each classes. And then we will take the highest score uh, to output its uh, predicted labels. So here, Let's, the, uh, let's check the, uh, check the dimen dimensionality of each variable. Suppose this image is size of 32 by 32 by three, not 600, 800, but we're using much smaller image now, uh, 32 by 32 by three, which is 3,072 numbers. That's the input size. And the output size is uh, because we have 10 classes, we would like to output 10 scores, and each of them corresponds to each class. Then, what is the output size of our uh, output? So our function f takes input image x and the weights w, and we output these scores. So what should be the output size? Mm, Kim bo -gyum. Yes. Yeah. What should be the output size? Um, we are given 3072 numbers as input. Yes. And what we'd like to have as output is the score for each class. So what should be the size of the output? Maybe um, sorry, I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. But you can try. Output means label X, right? Size label of, Y. Size um, label y. output of our model. What we want is Score for each class. So how many numbers should we output? 
in, in this example? Um, Three thousand seventy-two multiply ten. Uh, no, actually not. What the output size is the number of uh, scores we would like to have for each class, and we have ten classes here. Um. So, the uh, actually the output size is just ten. We need a score for each class. Do, do you understand it now? Yes. Okay, that's good. So yeah, we need just this 10 scores for corresponding to each class. So our model should output uh, just 10 numbers. And because we are using the column vector, it's 10 by one. Okay. And we are because we are using the linear model, we just multiply the W and X, the weights and the input image matrix are just multiplied like this. So, uh, what is the size of this uh, input image X? Dennis, red one? Uh, yeah, if we flatten the, uh, the image, it should just be uh, 3072, uh, yeah, like a column vector. Right, exactly. So it's correct. So the input image is flattened. So we have just 3072 numbers, as I showed here. Uh, so it's the column vector. So uh, this image size times one is the uh, input image size, input vector size. Then what should be the shape of this W? Uh, it should be, oh, still me? Uh, yeah, you can, you can answer. Ah, okay, and then it's uh, 10x uh, 3072. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's a good job. So yeah. Because uh, we need to multiply this W and X, and we need to output this 10 times 1, it should be 10 times 3072, which means we have this shape of the uh, uh, weights. We map uh, the score of the, uh, each pixel to each class, uh, and those numbers are expected to convey how much uh, that pixel is important to have the uh, score for that particular class. Here we actually add one more thing, which is called bias. So bias is um, some factor that we would like to learn from the data, but not actually interacting with the data in X, which means for each class, we would like to have some prior uh, score. So suppose we, we have the uh, more cat images in the data set than others, then we may expect that in the world, we have more cats than deers or dogs. Then we would like to uh, have some higher score for the cats, uh, even without seeing actually uh, the images, right? So bias term is uh, some additional term that we would like to have uh, to affect the output without interacting with the individual examples. So what should be the shape of this? Uh, I'm going to ask this to Song Jugyeong. Yes. Yes. What should be the shape of this uh, B? It should be 10 by 1. Why? Because um, the output, is, output label is 10 by 1. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, as, you, as uh, she said, the WX is also 10 by 1, and the output is also 10 by 1. And we need to add these two, so it should be the, in the same shape. And because this is independent of the image or the training examples, its shape must not have the number of uh, data points or the number of the image size, okay? Uh, so uh, let's do some tricks. Actually, uh, this B is important and we need to have this, but it makes things uh, a little bit more uh, complicated. So. Let's try to uh, actually incorporate this B into our weight matrix. So we have the 10 by 3000 and 3000 by one and 10 by one here. So we just incorporate this uh, one column into the, uh, just uh, concatenate that as the last column of the W, which makes 10 times 3073 instead of 72. And here for the X, we have uh, one vector 
all the ones at the at the bottom. Uh, at, uh, oh, sorry, just one, add one uh, at the bottom of this x. It has the 3,072 uh, values, and we have just one here. And when we compute the uh, vector uh, matrix uh, vector multiplication, uh, W and X will be multiplied, and B and one will be multiplied. And we call this WB as W prime, a new W. And this X and one, we call this as X prime. So this is new X. Then we can call this F is still W times X, but these are slightly different from the previous one, but uh, basically the same thing. Now we, it incorporates the uh, bias term uh, in, inside this. So from now on, we are going to just use uh, this term. So our linear model is WX, but automatically you should assume that it incorporates the bias terms like this. Okay, just for simplicity. And let's see uh, what is the advantages of these linear models over the nearest neighbor classifiers. So now our model is uh, like this. Given an x, uh, it's w times x, and w is the weight we learned from the data. So once trained, what we need is just the w. Once we have a new test point x, uh, then we, what we need to do is just multiplying this w and then it will give the output score for the 10 classes. So what we need is just W, and, but what is the shape of the W? It was 10 times 3,073. Time, uh, 3, what is the 10? Number of classes. What is the 3,000? The image size. It is independent of the number of images in the training data set. That is different from the nearest neighbor classifier, right? In the nearest neighbor classifiers, we had to store the entire training data set in the memory. And if we have very big data, like 1 billion or 10 billion images, we need that big uh, memory space or disk space. But here, what we need to store is just 10 times 3073. It's independent of the input, image, uh, input data sets, okay? So it's space efficient. And at test time, what we need to compute is just a single matrix vector multiplication, which is WX. So it's much faster than comparing against all the training data. So all the training data is again, it's like a 1 billion images. So we don't have to compute order of N, N is the number of uh, training Im images at the test time, which is much faster. Uh, so let's illustrate how does it actually work. So Suppose we have an image of four pixels, where this is more complicated images, but let's just suppose that's four image, four pixels, and it's called X, and we flatten it to uh, a vector of the same size, and W um, is the uh, W size was uh, size of the W was ten times uh, the number of pixels in uh, in the data set, so. 10 was the number of classes, so it's three here. So the first one, uh, we would like to output the score for the cat. And uh, these four um, values in the first row of this W matrix corresponds to each pixel in the input image. And each of those are multiplied like that. And we have the final outputs, which means uh, here to make this image as a cat, it needs to have high values in the last pixel because it's the, uh, you see that this is two is much higher than these other three values. So to classify this image as cat, we expect that the value of the last pixel is high. But here, actually, this image is not. So we expect that this is not a cat, which is incorrect, by the way. But uh, also, on the other hand, we have uh, some negative values in the second pixel. So to make this image um, as a cat, we expect that this uh, second value is as small as possible because it's, this is negative, uh, negatively affects the final score. So actually this is an example of completely different from uh, the cat. And uh, we have high, high score for the dog uh, because uh, for the dog, it, we can interpret that the three the first three values in this um, image 
should be as high as possible to make this as a dog. And this example is actually the case. And the last one is uh, zero, which means this pixel is not uh, positive or negative. Uh, it's not affects the decision whether this is a dog or not. So we can, you can interpret, the, interpret this weight vector like this. How important is pixel uh, to be uh, that entire image is classified as that class or not? And uh, from the geometric viewpoints, we can also interpret like this. So suppose we have just two uh, two dimensional input vector x1 and x2, and these three are learned classifiers. So for some image with higher x1 value and higher x2 values, what would be that class? Here we have three classifiers, and this yellow one gets larger scores to that direction, right? So if we have higher uh, pixel values in X1 and X2 in, in both of them, then we have higher chance that uh, that image belongs to this yellow class. What about this blue one? With higher uh, X1 scores, that actually goes, gets smaller. So that is negatively affects. So to be uh, the blue class, X1 needs to be small, as small as possible. And X2 needs to be as high as possible then it's blue class. What about the green one? The X2 needs to be as small as possible because uh, it's getting up, get, when it gets larger, then the green score gets smaller. But X1 is not affecting. So it's something like this zero. So uh, regardless of the X1 score, if the X2 is as small as possible, then it belongs to the green class. So we can interpret like that. And because these are just linear hyperplane, we, this, we call this as a linear classifier. It doesn't have any nonlinear shapes in the decision boundary. And uh, in this way, I actually assume that we take the highest score as uh, the, the, that uh, when, when we decide the class, we take the Can you hear me? Sorry, uh, my laptop was disconnected. So, uh, okay. So let's do this. So I can't see your screen, but uh. Sorry about this. So can you see the screen? Okay. Okay, good. So um, let's do this. Yeah, so uh, yeah, let me explain this part. So here we were using uh, the highest score among all the classes uh, as our prediction. But here, we actually give some threshold uh, of the scores to make this image as a car, uh, to accept it as a car, the score needs to be at least this uh, line. So uh, above this score, we uh, predicted as a car, but below it, we, we don't uh, accept it as a car. 
And the same thing for these airplanes and same thing for the, these deers. But in that case, uh, all the images within this triangle uh, belongs to no classes, none of those three classes, which is uh, true, actually. You should see some chicken here. It's not deer, it's not car, it's not an airplane. So uh, another way to make the decision boundary is setting some threshold of the scores for each class. And if it's not above that, then we uh, just drop it as a, a positive class. And in some cases, maybe it's some pictures in this region, then uh, it can be both car and deer, which is also possible. In an image, you can see uh, both car and a deer at the same time. So you may uh, assign some threshold like that to uh, make the decision boundary. And uh, yeah, we can classify the image into uh, that way. And another viewpoint of this linear classifier is uh, visual points, uh, visual viewpoints. So because we have the weight vectors for each class, uh, which was flattened before, but now we represent that as uh, the same shape of the input image. Actually, these are uh, the same size of the input image, right? So we may interpret this as another image. So we just rescale this between 0 to 255. And we can uh, uh, draw uh, how it actually looks like. So uh, when we um, just draw the, uh, the image of this W, the weights of each class, we have these um, broad images. But we roughly see that uh, this is something like a car. Actually, that was the, uh, classifier, uh, the weights for the uh, car classifier. And we do see that um, the car actually looks something like this. So uh, these are looking more like a red or um, the, the purple colored, which means uh, the training data may have more red colored cars in the data set. We can, we can uh, conjecture that. The horse also looks like this. And we, we expect that the uh, horse actually uh, are mostly t uh, taken um, in the background of this uh, green or greenish yard. And the ships are more, uh, in, in most cases, they are taken from the, the ocean. So uh, the background color is also learned from uh, the data set as the template. So this is another viewpoint, uh, the visual viewpoints. Uh, so yeah, here I, I mentioned that at the training, we learn this template from the training data. And at testing time, we perform the template matching from uh, the new examples. And we, we actually compare uh, the k nearest neighbors and this um, linear classifier like that. So in k nearest neighbor, we compare against all the training examples, which is uh, n. But here, we compare against these uh, number of uh, classes, or the number of templates, which is k. Here, we were, we were using 10, but n can be number of uh, like millions or billions. So usually k is much smaller than n, so uh, it's much more efficient to use this uh, linear classifier than the k nearest neighbors. So OK, uh, this is the end of today's lecture. And this is a reminder for um, our course websites. So I already have uh, linked the lecture slides uh, up to today and uh, the lecture notes. So this is also provided by the professor um, Fei Fei Li. And I slightly modified the lecture notes. So these are uh, a little bit more detailed version of what uh, I uh, lectured today. And uh, you are strongly encouraged to read this. And uh, the suggested reading also indicates these uh, textbooks. So uh, please visit the websites. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are encouraged to read these materials. So that's it. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask me now. Professor, I want to ask. There's about, no question. Oh, actually, Hoin, Chong Hoin. Yeah. Can I ask about the final project? Oh, sorry. Actually, uh, wait a moment. Yeah. Can you say again?
Yeah, can I ask you about the final project? Uh, sorry, actually, uh, after I was disconnected, I'm using another machine, which is the sound is not working. So <laughs> you may type the question, or I'll try to reconnect from this uh, laptop. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm I'm back. Yeah, can I can you hear me? Okay, 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 can you